as a lifelong Catholic, it shakes everything that you believe in. Accusers speak out as the Catholic Church in Texas reveals what they call credible allegations against priests. We have a responsibility, an obligation, to reach out and help bring about healing. As the church encourages victims to come forward, some accusers say that's not enough. They want justice in court. The only way that someone starts paying attention is they start criminally prosecuting. But we discovered it may be more difficult to make that happen here in Texas. Hello, and thank you for joining us for a special edition of State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Roman Catholic dioceses across Texas released lists of priests credibly accused of sexually abusing a minor. The names span nearly 70 years and join a growing number of allegations against clergy across Texas and the United States. The lists name more than 280 Catholic clergy members. That includes the 17 from the Fort Worth list made public over the past decade. The lists name clergy whose allegations have been investigated and reviewed by a board, but it does not mean they have been charged or convicted of sexual abuse. Church leaders tell us they hope the list will encourage more victims to come forward. Investigator Aaron Cargyle joins us now. You spoke with Austin Bishop Joe Vasquez just minutes after the list was released. I did, Josh, and he would not go into specifics about those on the list or details about what they're calling credible accusations. Of the 22 men on the Austin Diocese list, 12 of them are no longer living. One is still active in the diocese in Jamaica. The bishop also told me the diocese has no plans to get law enforcement involved beyond what they They've already reported. Why not invite law enforcement in? We could do that. We could have done that as well. But I think this is one step that's being still in the step of the right direction. So I don't think at this point any cases that we saw that needed to be referred to the law enforcement, we referred them to the law enforcement. If they come knocking on your door, will you hand over the files that you have? If, if they ask for that, if that's this is what they're going to do. You know, I, those are particular issues. I don't know the situation, so it's all hypothetical until it becomes real. In Texas, it is the law that doesn't matter who you are, you have a duty by law to report knowledge of sexual abuse of a child. Mm -hmm. That's correct. How does the church skirt that law, so to speak? We would say to those people, you must turn off, oh, you must uh, go to the authorities and report this. So we never prevent anyone from going to the authorities and, and, and reporting these cases. That's the first thing that I would say to them is, please do that. Please go and say to the authorities, I have been abused by a clergy. Do you think it is restoring faith in, in the church? I pray that it does. You know, that's my prayer. I, I hope it does. The church is hurting right now. My people are hurting. They're telling me they're hurting. They're suffering. And that pain is very evident. And so me as a clergyman, me as a shepherd, the bishop of this diocese, I have to be responsible to trying to take care of that. The bishop said they did try to reach out to accusers and give them a heads up that the list was coming out. I also asked him, what about adults who say they've been abused by clergy? He didn't want to talk about it on Thursday. He said that day the focus was about children who've been abused. All right, thank you, Aaron. It is important to note what this announcement is and what it is not. It does not change how the church handles allegations of abuse. A spokesman for the Austin Diocese said they are keeping the same rules and procedures they've had since 2002 when the U.S. Conference of Bishops ordered all dioceses to come up with a way to address and prevent abuse. That includes an 18-point explanation of things the church considers inappropriate, guidance on interacting with and supervising children, there have been some revisions since then, but essentially the ethics and integrity in ministry rules require anybody joining the diocese in any kind of official role to go through a background check and a workshop that teaches them skills to prevent abuse and how to spot it. And they do that every three years. It also lays out rules for reporting abuse allegations. Any accusations of a child being abused must be reported to authorities. That's a state law, but the diocese requires them to file a notice of concern with the diocese. It becomes a little more muddled when you talk about an adult who was abused as a child. Church officials are told to encourage that person to notify police and file a notice of concern themselves. This week's developments come as Pope Francis is preparing to hold a summit for bishops on clergy sex abuse next month in the Vatican. He said part of the event will be instructing church leaders how to investigate abuse cases and develop general protocols regarding victims. In a letter to U.S. bishops earlier this month, the Pope criticized what he called a lack of unity in the face of a sexual abuse crisis, saying internal bickering had damaged the credibility of the American church. 
The Texas list comes as victims across the nation are speaking up, urging the Catholic Church to reform its policies and report the accused to law enforcement. Investigator Brittany Glass tracked down a Texas man who grew up in New England and now hopes his story encourages others to come forward. We're concealing this man's identity because he's accused a priest of sexually abusing him when he was a child. Today, his own children still don't know what he says happened to him in the late 70s. Boston, Massachusetts, a city of skyscrapers, a town rich with American history, and a place where Catholic influence and tradition run deep. A Catholic priest was above a cop. Like, you could go to a Catholic priest about anything. This Austin man grew up in a devout Catholic family in the suburbs. He went to a small Catholic school that saw its fair share of predator priests. Two priests who made national headlines at the center of the church's child sex abuse scandal. Father Gagan is like the, the poster boy for pedophile priests in America. Father John Gagan, a serial child rapist who went on trial in 2006, was convicted and later killed in prison. The number one student got the Father Gagan Award. I, was, I got that award in eighth grade. He was a pedophile. And Father John Hanlon, sentenced to life in prison in 1994 for raping a teenage boy. But Hanlon always gave me a very strange feeling. But he says his abuser was a different priest who he confided in during a difficult time when just a first grader. He set up times to see me separately um, where he abused me. I didn't know what was going on because I'm seven and I know this doesn't feel right and I know this isn't right, but who am I going to tell? He says it went on for about a year. And it happened three times before a janitor broke this up and like soon after that, that janitor left and that priest was gone. He never told anyone about the abuse or the manipulation. This is a special relationship. I'm going to, you know, keep this between you and me and you can come to me anytime you want. The emotional scars live on. Someone stole something from you. Someone stole something from me and I can feel it. I look at pictures of myself before I was seven. I look at pictures of myself after seven where I had a huge weight gain and was biting my nails till they bled. Now, nearly 40 years after the abuse, he says he's tried reporting it to the church, receiving few answers in return. Around the time that I had my abuse, within a year of that, he's listed as sick leave. The problem still gets shuffled. If they can shuffle it, they still try and shuffle it. I don't know why anything in Texas would be different than Boston. He's advocating for others, he wants to see justice in court. The only way that someone starts paying attention is they start criminally prosecuting. That man also says he doesn't even know where that priest is today or if he's even still alive. Well, what did the school tell you? Well, Josh, when he tried to get the records, we were told he was a priest for the Society of African Missions, not with the Archdiocese of Boston. But we checked and this priest has never shown up on any sort of list there either. All right, Brittany, thank you. We will check in with you a little later. As accusations surface in Texas, our investigators look to places across the nation already tackling this problem. It sends another very clear message. People across this country are listening that the era of institutional cover-ups has ended. But we discover roadblocks for our state to investigate complaints about predator priests. There's reports like these and blow the whole thing up and prosecute and take down. In Texas, the law is set up differently. Some survivors of those abused by priests have been urging people to reach out to the Texas Attorney General and demand an independent investigation. We filed an open records request for copies of those letters and emails and ran across some pretty personal stories. This is a stack of letters to the AG and there's more than 100 messages in here, some from people who say they were abused by priests and clergy. The AG's office removed their names for confidentiality, but we still want to hear what they had to say in their own words. I am a fervent Catholic and have been subjected to sexual grooming here in Texas. Many Catholics are angry and want these clergy held accountable for their actions and face possible incarceration if their crimes warrant it. The grooming, the gaining of trust of both victim and family, the isolation of the victim. The church does not support the victim. It supports the clergy. 
Many victims, including myself, have gone to their church for justice and healing, only to find a self-serving institution whose only goal is to protect the church and its leaders. I am a survivor of sexual abuse by clergy. I know firsthand the pain and suffering experienced by those abused at the hands of clergy. The pain goes deeper than the sexual abuse itself. It not only involves the spiritual impacts, but also the undue stress associated with the discrediting and minimizing of the abuse by the Catholic Church. There was a case at the church I attended where the priest was sent off for quote-unquote treatment and abused again. He reportedly was supposed to have abused numerous children. He has since passed away. As a victim of torture and abuse by a priest as a child, I implore you to conduct an independent investigation. These survivors deserve better from your great state. We all deserve to be heard and justice to be served. Those are just a few examples of what Texans told the AG. Upon receiving these letters, the AG did tell them to contact their local law enforcement if they had not already done so. So why doesn't the Texas Attorney General take a more active role? We'll look at how the state's top law enforcer lacks the power to investigate complaints pouring into his office. And our investigators look to places across the nation already tackling this problem. Sends another very clear message. People across this country are listening that the era of institutional cover-ups has ended. The success of one state's investigations and why that could be hard to duplicate here in Texas. In recent months, prosecutors across the country have ripped open the doors of the Catholic Church. Investigator Jody Barr discovered some of those state investigations revealed evidence that even the Vatican knew about this abuse. Yes, Josh, but they failed to do anything about it. Now, Pennsylvania's Attorney General charged two priests after a two-year criminal investigation into that state's dioceses. That investigation ended last July. The question now, could this happen in Texas? Father David Polson is one of two Pennsylvania priests arrested, charged, and convicted of weaponizing faith to molest children. Polson and Father John Sweeney are the first priests charged in what's now known as the most in-depth priest sex abuse criminal investigation so far. Pennsylvania's Attorney General assembled a statewide grand jury to investigate six of the state's eight Catholic dioceses. Last year, the grand jury report revealed 301 predator priests in those six dioceses. The Philadelphia and Altoona Johnstown dioceses were investigated by prior grand juries. All told, since 2011, Pennsylvania grand juries identified 372 Catholic clergy members as sexual abusers there, and it was all kept secret until the search warrants landed on church steps. Sends another very clear message here in Jefferson County and all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and indeed I believe people across this country are listening, that the era of institutional cover-ups has ended. Despite what Pennsylvania's AG exposed there, Texas has no plans to do the same. Texas's top law enforcer is leaving it to district attorneys and to the state's 15 dioceses to handle sex abuse allegations themselves. We listened to victims and one of the things that they articulated was an experience and a frustration of not having been heard and not having been believed. In 2007, the Fort Worth Diocese released a list of clergy with what it called credible allegations. It's the only Texas Catholic diocese to do that. The list included 17 names with allegations dating back to 1969. 11 of those clergy members are dead. Only two of those named were convicted and sent to prison. The first was Father Thomas Texar, who was a priest at five separate Fort Worth area parishes. He was convicted of molesting an 11-year-old boy. Texar died in a Texas prison in 2015. In October, a judge handed down a five-year prison sentence to the deacon of this Wichita Falls Catholic Church. Russell William Detweiler pleaded no contest to aggravated sexual assault of an eight-year-old girl. 
Now, Dallas law enforcement is hunting for another priest, Father Edmundo Paredes. He's accused of molesting three boys in the Fort Worth Diocese while ministering to a parish and a school. When there is a wolf in sheep's clothing, that is startling enough. But when there is a wolf in shepherd's clothing, clothing that is horrendous. And so in there, therein lies our, our, our grave concern. Paredes, the diocese says, is now on the run. Still, we've received no indication from Texas of plans to do anything like what was done in Pennsylvania. Josh. Well, we reached out to the Texas AG's office. A spokesperson told us they do not have the legal power to investigate unless they're asked by the district attorney's office to step in and help. Some states have the ability to go in to an issue where there's reports like these and blow the whole thing up and prosecute and take down. In Texas, the law is set up differently. Rylander says state law does not give the attorney general primary jurisdiction over these cases. Primary jurisdiction is the ability to investigate a local matter alone. Investigating and prosecuting allegations against priests must begin with local police and district attorney's offices, he says. They must ask the AG to step in to lead or to help on a local crime. We did find out lawmakers have the power to change that. Some told us they're interested in exploring it this legislative session. Austin Democrat Eddie Rodriguez said he would support Support legislation that gives the Texas Attorney General the authority needed to protect Texas children and shine light on institutional cover-ups of such heinous illegal activity. Another Austin Democrat, Celia Israel, echoes that, telling us priests and other religious leaders are not exempt from the law and no institution should get away with hiding criminal activities. I've had many sleepless nights. I've had many tears shed over this. Ahead, we hear from an accuser in Austin who says her priest assaulted her during confession. Our investigative team works to track down that woman's alleged abuser and reveals a lawsuit with several other women accusing the same priest. That's coming up on this special edition of State of Texas. It is never okay for someone to touch you inappropriately. And when that comes from a supposed man of God, you really begin to question everything. Several women have come together to file a civil lawsuit against a former Austin priest, Father Isidore Nadegizamana, or Father Izzy. One of those women tells investigator Brittany Glass the priest used his power to isolate, then assault her during confession. She agreed to speak with us if we protected her identity, and as you mentioned, she is part of that civil lawsuit, which claims the Austin Diocese moved the priest from one parish to another to cover up complaints like hers. You're already in a vulnerable position when you are in the confessional. It's seen as a sacred space. As a predator, he took advantage of that vulnerability. This woman says confession with Father Izzy escalated to assault. I was completely terrified. She says the priest touched her inappropriately, then wouldn't let her leave. I didn't know what to do. This woman never called police. She told herself she didn't have to. She says she trusted the diocese when they told her they'd take care of the issue. We fully expected to have their full support of us. And when that didn't happen, it was alarming to all of us. They don't do anything to keep us safe. And for that reason, I don't go to confession anymore. She says when she complained, she was told there was nothing the diocese could do. After all, confessions are confidential, secret. They could not ask him what happened because of the seal. I understand that my words are protected, but his actions are not. Still, Father Izzy remained at St. Thomas More. To continue to attend mass and receive communion from him, it felt like we were being put in our place. A lawsuit filed by this woman and five others with similar stories claims the diocese knew about Father Izzy's behavior before he arrived at the Northwest Austin Parish in 2012. The suit alleges the diocese received similar complaints about Izzy while he served in at least four other previous parishes in the area. All of the suffering that we have endured could have been prevented if the diocese had taken care of this. 
After St. Thomas More, Father Izzy was moved again to Brenham, Texas, where he served as an associate pastor. There should be zero tolerance for this behavior, period. Now the women behind the lawsuit are demanding protection from priest abuse for everyone. I don't understand why they will not make the necessary changes to their policies to include every person. And that's what this lawsuit is about. We want them to change their policy. We don't want to change our faith. The lawsuit says Father Izzy's time in Brenham only lasted about a month. As more accusers at St. Thomas More continued to come forward, the diocese tells us he was ultimately removed from active ministry, meaning he is still a priest, but he is not allowed to do anything in public as a priest. And it's important to remember that Father Izzy has not been convicted on any criminal charges related to this civil lawsuit. That's right, and none of the accusers have gone to police either at this point. And now that the diocese's list of accused clergy is out, many hope it prompts people People to come forward to law enforcement with any abuse allegations. To catch up on our complete coverage, go to our special page called The Accused to see the list of names for yourself and use our interactive map to find the places where these priests worked. Just look for The Accused feature in the Texas Politics section of your station's website. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.